Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for joining us for the session today. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started. And uh, a few minutes ago, I walked out through the room and encouraged people who were here for the panel to uh, move forward if you so desire. Uh, so I just wanted to say that again for people who are coming in. Uh, if you have to leave early, no problem. We, you know, you can scooch out and do your whole thing. You don't have to sit in the back if you have to scoot out. Um, and again, thank you for coming to our session, which is called A Will to Change, Building Community Solidarity Across Multi-Generational Lines. Uh, my name is Angela Booker, and I uh, had the honor of curating, I guess, the Beyond Youth Voices track. And in that process, uh, I had a number of conversations that led to the development of this panel. Um, we are going to take a pretty informal tack with this conversation, largely because uh, we think that it'll benefit the goal of the conversation, which is to be more fluid about uh, the kind of work that we're doing and what we think are the directions we might be interested in going, the challenges we might be having. And we don't necessarily know where the shared uh, challenges are and where, uh, we're, uh, where we're diverging. And so, uh, all that's to say, uh, we really welcome participation and feedback. I think all of us up here have considered jumping off of this stage and <laughs> coming closer to you, uh, but I don't th think that the, uh, uh, the setup will allow for it, so sorry to be so distant from you. Um, okay, so with that, um, I want to very briefly uh, do my own version of introducing this panel, which means that I'm not going to tell you about the organizations or the work that everyone's doing because they can speak to that. Uh, more effectively and more elegantly themselves. What I would like to share with you is my experience with each of our panelists as I tried to put this panel together um, as a way of introduction. Um, so, but first, um, I do community-based work. Um, I'm a new transplant to the UC San Diego campus in the Department of Communication. Um, and uh, probably the most significant thing in my life right now is that uh, I have a five-year-old and a five-month-old at home. So there's a little bit about me, um, which tells you something about my state of mind, I hope. <laughs> um, so uh, first, I'm, I'm going to introduce, I'm just going to introduce you all, and then you can come up and have your turns. So um, one of the first people I talked with about this panel was Lissa Soap, who's sitting right here. And um, the thing that I want to share with you about Lissa is that she has been a go-to mentor for me uh, the entire time I've been doing this work. Uh, since I was a student. Um, she has this really wonderful way of developing really tangible critiques that you can work with that make everyone feel involved in a process. Um, I think it's really easy to critique and tear people down and kill little fledgling seedling ideas. Um, and it's much harder to nurture ideas while still holding the space for critiques about what we might be missing. And Lissa is brilliant at that. Um, she's also um, just been a remarkably human person, just so human. I don't know if you know what I mean by that, but if you get the chance to interact with her, I think you'll know immediately. So um, I think that's really critical when you're doing uh, community work and you're trying to do something transformative. It requires being present and really listening and seeing people and then seeing them again and then seeing them again. And I feel like Lissa is just really incredible at that. Um, so that's my experience with Lissa. Um, the other thing is that she really shaped this panel um, in one of our first conversations by talking about a transition in her own work um, that has really caused her to think deeply about how you organize with communities and what you have to commit to in a deep way. So I, I think you'll talk more about that, so I don't want to steal any thunder. Um, Sasha uh, is the next person that I spoke with, and um, I met Sasha last year, actually, and one of the best things that I can say to give you a sense of Sasha is um, that I, had the, I have these colleagues that I sadly have um, not been able to get, uh, continue working with as closely at UC Davis, and they met Sasha, and they were like, he is the person we've been looking for all our lives. Like, you brought us to DML so we could meet Sasha. <laughs> Um, they are organizing in schools in a really careful way, and they are looking for ways to, uh, to, have, to use digital media to, to map and connect with what young people know and sort of do uh, ethnographies with the youth in their communities. And Sasha was like, I got a tool for that. I got a resource for that. Let me connect you with an organization. Sasha is the ultimate connector. But more than that, he is a leader 
in what we should be thinking about and doing in these conference spaces. So this is the first time that I've organized a conference session like this. Um, and when I got on the phone with Sasha, he said, have you considered um, going to visit some organizations in Boston? Here are some great ones that you might want to consider. Uh, maybe you could organize something with a conference. Um, have you thought about how uh, you're going to try to fund um, or how the conference is working to fund bringing youth here? Have you thought about these things? Where's the space for organizing? You had all these great questions that really were actionable and they showed me ways to be a better organizer and to think about some of the challenges we have in a space like DML. So I wanna thank you for that, Sasha. Um, then I spoke with uh, Teresa Basilio of the Global Action Project, who unfortunately um, has had uh, an injury and is not able to be here. But luckily for us, she has a co-director at the Global Action Project, Jesse Aaron Saft Holly. Um, if you could see it written, you would know why we just had a little exchange of celebration. Um, Jesse. Uh, and Teresa are uh, co-directing the Global Action Project. Um, and my experience with them was very much around, um, well, first with Teresa, it was very much around um, critical pedagogy in a lot of ways. Uh, and what are we really teaching about? And what does it mean to be an adult ally? Um, what does it mean to really be in solidarity? And so the solidarity aspect of this panel really started to emerge through that conversation. And Jesse has graciously stepped in to participate in our panel, and we just met last night for the first time. And what I've learned really quickly about Jesse is that he knows how to warm up the room. He's like sunshine. <laughs> um, and he knows how, one of the things he taught me last night was how to create space and open space without shutting people down. Uh, and making it fun and showing people how to do that together. And that is really critical when we do voice work because so many voices have to get in the room. How do you make room for all the voices? And how do you do that without shutting people down and excluding them from the space? And Jesse seems to be really, really talented with that. So I thank you for that. And now finally, I'm gonna speak about Jenny and Corey of Zoomix, one of the organizations that Sasha introduced me to. Um, Probably we've had the least direct interaction, but the first thing that is the most striking to me is that these are yes people. These are people who hear about something, they say, yo, you want us to come to a conference and have this conversation and engage in these really kind of vague ways? <laughs> yes, we're gonna do it, we'll be right there. Next week, no problem. You wanna come visit our site? Great, it's wide open for you. And I think that that is also critically important, that ability to hear an idea to express appreciation for it, to see how you can link to it and contribute to it, and just say yes. And I find that um, experiences like this, especially as an academic, a lot of uh, the early sort of <coughs> mentoring we get is to say no. Protect your time, protect your space, say no, say no, say no. And again, I think in community work, that ability to give genuine yeses and to get excited about something raises the energy and the quality of what you can do together. It creates an audience of warmth and receptivity. Um, and that really opens up again what's possible. So that's my experience of the people um, on this panel. And um, so that's how I wanted to introduce them to you so you can have a little sense of who they are um, from my perspective, which is not just who they are. Um, so what we're gonna do for the rest of the panel is I'm gonna sit down and each of them are gonna talk about uh, an aspect of their work with a the theme in mind um, for the panel. Then after we hear each other, I'm gonna first ask the panel what questions are coming up for them. And then uh, I'm gonna sort of try to facilitate a conversation around shared questions that I've come up with, that they've come up with, and then we'll be taking your questions and comments and you know, we'll do a little push-pull together and, uh, and see how that goes. Sound good? Okay, welcome. Do you want your set up? Oh, it doesn't touch. It doesn't actually, the button doesn't actually touch. Oh, it doesn't, okay. Okay, check one, two, hi. Can you hear me? Okay. I can't turn it off. Um, so I'm Sasha Costanza Chak. I'm assistant professor of civic media at MIT's comparative media studies and writing department. Um, I'm also a co-principal investigator at the Center for Civic Media at MIT. Um, 
And I'm, I'm really excited that we're, that we're having this, this conversation. Um, I, I, I think that um, you know, I'm, I'm honored to be here on the panel and to be part of, of this conversation. Um, I'm just gonna speak really briefly about, uh, a little bit about the way that I work and the way that I um, try and do work that's, uh, that, that's tied to and, and grounded in uh, existing work of community-based organizations. And I'll try and keep it really short so that we have more time just to talk. Um, I have a, a background spending a lot of time doing popular education style media making workshops uh, in, Los, in Los Angeles especially, uh, working with immigrant rights organizations, particularly the Institute of Popular Education of Southern California, EDEPSCA. Um, EDEPSCA works with low-wage immigrant workers um, in Los Angeles, uh, is an anchor member of the National D Domestic Worker Alliance and is an anchor of the uh, National Day Labor Organizing Network. And they also have a school called Aprendamos, um, which is a K through six school. And I, I think I'm, I'm bringing them up because of the topic of the panel is around you know, community and solidarity across generations. And to me, I learned so much from, from spending several years working in the context of IDEPSCO, working with them to develop a series of digital media making workshops and developing a, a platform um, called VASMOB or Voces Mobiles, VASMOB.net, um, which is a place where folks from Edepska's community base can post stories via the cheap cell phones that most people in that community have access to um, by voice calls and by, by picture messages. But that tool was really integrated into their community organizing process, which is grounded in Freire, in popular education, is grounded in not non-campaign based community organizing, where the, you know, the community is, uh, like, like Freedom Inc. and Madison says, the community is the campaign. So it's about really like building community, um, which doesn't mean that there aren't particular policy goals or victories or you know, people in positions of power in the city of Los Angeles or statewide or even at the federal level that they're trying to, to push, excuse me, with the, um, with the work that they're doing. But it means that it's, you know, you, you go to a meeting in Edepska's office and there are young children and there are middle school and high schoolers and there are 20 and 30 somethings and there are elders and they're sitting around the table together talking about, okay, how is the media portraying us in our community? What is, what's the first hit that you get when you search Google for day laborers? Oh, it's by this hate group, this anti-immigrant hate group. Um, how can we deal with that? How do we change the narrative about our community? How do we make our own media and tell our own stories um, given that we have, you know, uh, such low levels of access to broadband in the home and computers in the home. Um, so working with them just really grounded a lot of the work that I do um, around starting by, by listening, um, by listening to community, like what are the modes in which you're organizing, what are, the, what are the media platforms that are actually useful to your community, but more importantly, how are you integrating media making into a process of uh, developing critical consciousness how is the media that you're making linked actually to the organizing work that you're doing? Um, and so that approach, it really kind of informs all the, the, the research and practice that I do. Um, maybe I'll just, I'll, I'll stop by just mentioning one other project, which is work, work that, um, that I'm working on now. Um, so uh, I'm now involved in a project called the Out for Change Transformative Media Organizing Project, which is a, actually, would you, would you mind just pulling it up on the thing? Thanks, it's in the Firefox browser. So this is a uh, national uh, project, and yeah, if you could just open it up to, thanks. Oh, oh that didn't work. Wait, Maybe just drag it from the corner. It it's a little small from a distance, yeah. sorry. Anyway, this is a national project. Uh, it has two big components. One is uh, research into what are, thank you, um, what are the media making practices that LGBTQ and Two-Spirit organizations are engaged in? How are folks thinking about using media in their organizing work and as an organizing tool? Um, and that involves a national survey that actually just launched this week. Uh, it involves a series of interviews it's a participatory research process, so the, the main photo there is 
the folks from the project partners all sort of meeting at MIT in November to come up with the research questions together and the approach that we wanted to take to the research. Um, and it involves a series of skill shares. So every month, um, one of the project partners, we're, we're sort of working with them to develop uh, skill shares that happen via Google Hangouts, uh, where people are sharing their approach to media organizing work. And in the lower corner where it says skill shares, there's an image from uh, Streetwise and Safe, which is one of the project partners. Uh, the skill share that they did just last week was about how Streetwise and Safe is using media to organize uh, trans youth of color uh, in New York City who are targeted, heavily targeted by NYPD stop and frisk policies uh, because they're youth of color and because specifically they're trans youth of color, they're assumed to be doing sex work and if they have condoms on them, then they're arrested uh, for doing sex work. And so in that context, SAS, Streetwise and Safe, has developed these media materials, which is a condom case, um, which has a know your rights, you know, what, what are your rights when you're stopped by the police inside the condom case. Um, so they were really sharing their process of coming up with this type of media strategy. So a physical media strategy, it's a flyer embedded in this object, um, and that comes directly out of the lived experience of the community they're working with. And we have a number of really amazing uh, partners in this project who, um, just for the sake of time, I'll, I'll stop now, but the point is that it's about beginning by listening to a community organization, to a collective, to a group, to a network, folks who are already organizing against the intersectional forces of oppression that we're all, that, that, that people face, um, and using media that's appropriate to their own communities based on their lived experience, and then figuring out how to build off that and lift it up and amplify that work. Hi, I'm Lissa. That was awesome. I can't wait to talk more about it. Um, so I thought, um, by way of opening remarks, just to say something about um, my own trajectory in, um, with respect to the question that Angela posed to us about working in solidarity with community. Um, because I would start by saying that um, I came into the work that I do currently um, having been in graduate school at the very tail end of my dissertation writing process. and in some ways kind of jumping ship. Um, not entirely, but um, I was you know, close to the end and heard a story on the radio, um, a teenager reporting on an aspect of her life. And um, when she signed off on that report, she um, used the, the tagline for youth radio. I'm Jacinda Abkarian. And I realized that this organization that I'd been hearing over the years, uh, young people sharing reporting and commentary, um, for National Public Radio and other outlets was near my, near where I lived, near where I was working, near where I was kind of pulling my hair out trying to finish my dissertation. And um, I started uh, volunteering at the organization and it really fundamentally shifted my relationship to the work that I wanted to do. And I don't want to say it was out of some kind of principled stance of um, seeking solidarity in that moment. I think it was a little bit about um, what I wanted to leave in the work that I was doing, but I think it was more about just being drawn into the kind of activity that was happening in this space where young people and adults were working together on projects that had real stakes, that were story driven, but had wider um, aspirations for impact and that would go out to significant audiences. Um, that was something I wanted to be a part of. So that was the beginning of a kind of turn, turn for, for myself in terms of my relationship to what it could look like to do research um, uh, in the tradition of ethnography, but um, you know, in that kind of participant observation equation that we all work within as ethnographers, kind of starting to lean much more onto the participation side of that, of that dynamic. Because prior to that, prior to my move more into um, a space of kind of collaboration um, with youth and communities, I, I carried out what I think about now as a kind of bite your tongue ethnography. Um, and that might be because I was studying discourse, so I didn't want to interfere or intervene too much in the kind of data that I was um, collecting. But when I examine it now from the point of view of the theme of the panel, 
I'm also wondering if part of my reticence in that earlier phase of my work was about a kind of swooning over, like a kind of uncritical swooning over um, what young people can do in these peer-driven spaces on their own and wanting to just kind of erase and not see um, adult engagement and, and, and involvement in that activity. Um, that uh, became a lot more difficult to do, that kind of bracketing or blocking out of the intergenerational dimensions of the work uh, when I became one of the <laughs> adults who was trying to, to work in this environment with colleagues and um, started to have to really look more critically at um, these dynamics between young people and adults. Um, one of the things that that more critical look allowed me to do was recognize some of the misguided attempts at solidarity that I had been prone to at <laughs> other points in my research. So just briefly, I'll uh, share a story of a, a time early in my work when I was studying a group of boys, teenage boys, who at the time spent all their free time with their friends making what at that time we would have called camcorder movies, you know, of every kind of B genre, you know, gangster movies and um, gambling movies and mob movies, and every one of them ended in these like spectacles of, of um, you know, violence and um, these kind of masculine themes. But when you look closely at the language that they were using in, in producing these movies, they were marked with all of these features that we typically associate in the research literature with female gendered patterns of speech. So I got very interested in, in tracking this activity, but at the same time, I sought to belong in this community. I wanted a place for myself in the community to such an extent that when it came time for them to film a car chase scene as one of, uh, you know, in Daly City in one of these movie making extravaganzas, I offered my car <laughs> that they should go ahead and, yeah, sure, use my car. So that's, that's one of those moments of, of, you know, where I think um, in looking at what we're driving for in efforts to achieve solidarity sometimes, um, you know, we can... Um, indulge in a kind of desire to belong that isn't necessarily looking carefully at, um, at what that role needs to be in order to be a productive participant in the work that's being done. So that's, that's part of the, you know, not that that was typically a pattern in my work, um, but it was something that I noticed as I started to account more carefully for um, the kinds of relationships that young people and adults um, form together as they're producing media with, an, uh, with a goal towards some kind of social impact. And one of the frameworks for um, starting to think about solidarity that Vivian Chavez and I started to work through is this notion of collegial pedagogy. So what does it look like in, um, in communities where young people um, and adults together are producing work where there's a kind of mutual engagement there's a joint um, vulnerability to um, what will happen once that work goes out into the world, as well as a, a kind of mutual accountability to getting it right. And, um, and at the same time, what you might define as a kind of interdependent expertise. So how can we create more and more conditions for young people so that um, neither party could carry out the work independently to the same level of quality and impact that can happen when um, they're joining forces? to do the work together. That was kind of the highest aspiration for, for where collegial pedagogy seems to have the strongest impact. That being said, within these environments where um, we've got young people and adults working in collegial capacities, a lot of tension can start to rise up around this question of youth voice, or more directly, what does it mean to do youth-driven media production? Um, so I recently, at Youth Radio, um, uh, was a part of a process where we put together a series of scenarios and asked ourselves what is the youth-driven approach when um, one of four pressures hit. So one is deadlines, so when you do work that is um, held to very demanding serious deadlines and something has to turn around fast. Um, and there's a great opportunity for a piece of media to get out to a massive audience, tens of millions of listeners, if you can do it quickly, but let's say the young person who's working on the story isn't going to be there until Thursday at 4 o'clock. So what is the youth-driven response um, to that kind of pressure? Similarly, around stakes. How do we stay connected to young people when um, they're taking on stories that will have digital afterlives for themselves that could um, continue to affect their opportunities moving forward beyond the project, as well as um, the high stakes of getting it right so that um, 
when the work goes out, the kind of critique that comes back is one that we're prepared for and that we can, again, stand in solidarity with the young people who are, who are claiming and authoring that story. Skills is another one of the, um, one of the uh, pressures and tensions around youth-driven activity, but the one that I want to hit on um, as just uh, one of the final thoughts on this opening remark, it connects to what Angela um, brought up related to a shift in my own work, and that is a set of pressures with respect to youth-driven activity around sustainability. And that came out um, in a very vivid way for us at Youth Radio when we um, launched an app lab within our production company. So in addition to doing youth journalism, which is what Youth Radio is best known for as NPR's Youth Desk and having a long tradition of doing um, youth reporting and commentary production, we, um, a colleague, Asha Richardson and I, in 2010, launched an app lab where young people started developing mobile apps in partnership with designers and developers. It's a very different workflow that happens, as many of you know, um, when I learned too late that 95% of the work happens after a platform is built. And of course, we had created a program assuming that 95 or 99% of the work went into making it. Um, so how do we create projects for communities where we're not making false promises, right? So one of the first apps that Youth Radio created was one called Forge City. It was a food sharing app. Tremendous amount of work and excitement went into it, but when it came time to have to do iteration after iteration after iteration in order to get that that app right, we realized we're not a food justice organization. And so we had to really rethink the kinds of projects that we would take on so that they could be sustainable within the communities that they sought to, um, to affect and inform. Otherwise, you know, when we use a kind of hackathon mentality of like banging out prototypes and making big promises out of what um, kind of an effect they can have, we end up potentially doing more harm than good. So that's one of, an, another kind of turning point learning moment that I've had um, in the space of carrying out this kind of um, practice. Um, and then finally on the research tip, um, how do we do research that is in, in um, solidarity with communities? One of the things that um, I think about a lot is uh, a line, and this is the last thing I'll say, um, from an anthropologist, Johann Fabian, who talked about um, traditions within anthropology where he said, talking about the people that anthropologists studied, quote, the ethnographer will be an ethnographer only if he outlives them, i.e. if he moves through the time he may have shared with them into a level on which he finds anthropology. And I think so much of the breakdowns in solidarity when it comes to research that's aimed towards having some kind of community accountability and engagement is when we fall into that trap, that we find anthropology, we find insights, we find analysis only after we've shared an experience and then moved away from that experience and then from that position start to issue um, outcomes. And I came from a panel earlier today with Megan McDermott and her colleagues, Jesse, where it was the reverse of that, where it's the, the, the research is being carried out, the findings are being produced, the analysis is being done in real time. Um, with, with those community um, partners and collaborators. So that's more and more the kind of work that I aspire to do as well. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Corey Hello. DePina. Hello. I'll be sharing my speech with uh, Jenny. Hi. Hi, I'm Jenny Shulman. I'm the program director at Zoomix. I'm a program coordinator at Horizon Mix. Uh, thank you guys for allowing us to be here to talk about what we do and to share our message. Um, when thinking about the idea of solidarity uh, in our programming, we changed the word solidarity to harmony. Um, and how can we create harmony within both our programming and what we do and what we offer to the community. Uh, give you a little bit of history. Zoomix started in 1991. Uh, the initial idea uh, was to keep kids safe and out of the streets. Our mission is empowered youth who use music to make a strong positive change in their lives, their communities, and the world. 91 marking one of the biggest years with youth on youth violence in Boston. Uh, our director opened up her home and started to do programming with a, a solid foundation of arts as a tool for expression. Uh, so we offer a bunch of different programs. Uh, we have radio, journalism, songwriting and performing, uh, theater, audio technology, 
in instrumental music, and then through those different categories, we offer a bunch of different programs, both after school and in the summertime. We also have a partnership with the East Boston High School and a partnership with the Yamana Barnes High School, where we go in and we offer a bunch of different classes there, uh, poetry, journalism, uh, drumline. Uh, Zoomix kind of grew organically. Uh, the first programs that we did were writing programs because we had no money for instruments and we had no space and we had no equipment. Uh, and then it subtly evolved organically uh, from just the songwriting to actually instrumental lessons. And then from instrumental lessons to technology, you figure you write a song, you need a band. You need a band, you need amplification. You need amplification, then you go out and you do performances. So we had kids do live shows. And then uh, it grew to where we're at now. Uh, we have a radio station also, and we spent uh, eight years doing a big capital campaign and raising a little bit over $5 million to redevelop an old firehouse out in East Boston that we now uh, live in. It's a state-of-the-art performance center. Uh, we serve about 150 kids every semester, which are breaking down into seasons, uh, spring, summer, and the winter, fall season. Uh, we work with kids ages seven through 18, and usually I introduce Zoomix as being one of the best nonprofits in the United States of America, uh, but I forgot to do that today. We did win the Arts and Humanities Award in 2011 uh, from the White House, and we got to have some kids meet First Lady Miss Obama uh, and recognize some of the work that we do. And as we continue to talk about the work that we do here, uh, just keep in mind uh, that we do uh, keep at the core of our programming empowerment, civic engagement, and artistic development. And Jenny will go in and tell you more about that. So our program model uh, is based on the theory of change, um, which is that if youth participate in high quality arts programs, then they'll develop specific skills and competencies which lead to a set of intermediate outcomes, which are 21st century skills, life skills that we all need. Um, these lead into long-term outcomes that together constitute life success. So it's like this recipe and each ingredient makes a awesome human being. <laughs> um, and what this does, we, we break it down into I am, which is personal development. I create, which is artistic development. And we connect, which is civic engagement. And this model helps youth see themselves, and it helps them recognize that they have an important voice. Um, at Zoomix, we think that youth culture is a voice that is often clouded, clouded by adultism. And we don't, we don't subscribe to this. So a lot of what Corey and I do is it's all about what the kids think. We have uh, group agreements that the kids make. We don't have rules. Um, kids make the rules for each class, and it's not a really rules, but a way of being. So, um, you know, what do you need to do the best work possible? And even at the beginning of it, just having kids think about those three questions. Like if I asked you, finish the sentence. I am, I create, and I connect. And even giving young people the opportunity to think about the answers to those questions begins to turn the wheel. What am I? I am an artist. I am a rapper. I am a journalist. I create stories. I create music. I create dance. And then how do you connect that? I connect with my high school, with my neighborhood, with my community. And when you take those three things and you put them together, at the core of it, you have then resilience. You have what we called an empowered youth, someone who can make decisions, who can think critically and then go back and give that back to the community. So we wanted to show you a couple examples of this. Um, uh, Corey, is, uh, Corey is an amazing teacher <laughs> and he has a songwriting and performance class and in the summer they do a tour and the fall they create an album and they record it in the studio and in the spring they do a music video. And usually the programs are evolved around what are important to you, what are some issues and themes that we can talk about as a group that are important to us in our community, and how can we go out and express that and share that with the rest of the world. The summer program where I take kids on tour is really exciting because you get kids from the city out in the woods, then back to New York, then out to Vermont, out to Providence, Connecticut, 
and we have partnerships with all these other organizations where my kids then perform for other youth, and those youth host and perform for our kids, so we're connecting young artists together, and we're having them all understand that there's a shared vision of change, and uh, a, a space where kids can, can grow and develop ideas. In the video program, because it's a bigger picture, we want to share it with the world, we try to talk about issues that are more global, and last year, uh, one of the big things that all kids were talking about was bullying, and this video right here was written by the young lady who's featured as the, the girl being rejected throughout the video, and the, the boys sang it, the kids composed, wrote, shot, directed, edited. Played the instruments. And everything, uh, and the project started with nothing, and by the end of 14 weeks, we ended up with this video. Another, treat you like my sister and brother Hold hands through these bullies Even though you hurt and mess with me We stand strong as one We're family B.I.G uh. It's just a phase Don't be phased Another day, another game I'm not afraid I overcame The obstacles in hell you made Find the strength to walk away Now I know how to be brave How to Corey. <laughs> 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 
so we think, we think that that's a really good example that illustrates um, how important the youth voice is, um, not only to their peers, but to, to the whole, to, you know, to the whole world, to the community that they're in and um, communities that they share across country, across borders. Um, another example that we have to, that we want to show you is a song uh, called Home that was written by one of our students named Star Desmond. Star is uh, 16 and she wrote this song um, to express her feelings about the marathon bombings last year. Uh, and she was really sad that, that, uh, that her home was being defined by one act of violence. And she included all the aspects of what she loved about Boston into this home because she wanted to remind people that that one act of violence shouldn't define what she, what she calls home. Uh, and by doing this through her music, she made an impact on those who he heard it. Um, last uh, December, she, uh, in December, she performed this at the Mary Baker Eddy Library for their event called Caring for Community, um, which featured uh, other, other stories um, about people who have done caring things in their neighborhoods or for their city or for their state or the country. Um, and she also performed it at the Mural Forum for Arts and Culture uh, to show how important uh, youth arts education is. Angela, we have youth audio uh, engineers for their next conference. <laughs> uh, how can I leave the tutorial? I don't want the tutorial. Goodbye, tutorial. The interesting thing about the Zoomix approach is that within our mission, it's empowered youth who use music to make a strong, positive change in their lives first, right? in their community, and then the world. So uh, even within our own mission, the idea of first representing yourself, sharing that with your community, and how does that make an impact to the rest of the world um, is within all of our lessons, all of our programs, all of our measured outcomes, the idea of someone growing. Kids go to Zoomix and stay with us forever, usually. <laughs> they start really young and never leave. This is a song by Star Desmond. City light shining down, people gathering round, performers on the street, dancing to a cool beat. Or you can go downtown and do some walking around, shop for what you need. Crazy side out, it's a 
okay to be loud It's not a small town So this photo that we have up, just to conclude, this is this is Zoomix, and those are all our kids. And on April, <laughs> April 27th, we have our biggest fundraiser of the year, which is the Walk for Music. Um, and if you want more information on it, if you want to join us, you're all more than welcome. We love, uh, like Angela said, we love saying yes to people, and we love um, we love inviting people into our family. Hello, everybody. My name's Jesse Aaron Saftal. Is this on? Can you hear me? Yes? Um, and I'm the co-director of Global Action Project. Global Action Project is a New York City-based organization that works with young people to develop the skills, knowledge, tools, and relationships to build community power, cultural expression, both individual and collective, and make political and social change in New York City and beyond, nationally and globally, even. Um, and I wanted to start, I'm relatively new as a staff person to Global Action Project, but I've known Global Action Project and been a huge fan for at least a decade. Um, and the first time I really made significant contact with Global Action Project was as, in terms of the programming was about three years ago. My background is in both youth development and youth organizing with arts and culture as a strand consistently thread through, through both. Um, and I was working in an LGBTQ youth service organization, and we went to Global Action Project's year-end screening. This is, I think, back in 2011. And all the, each of Global Action Project's programs, which are the programs that we still run today, presented their final film. And so the first was a film by our group um, Super Friends, which is an LGBTQ young people's media-making group. And they, they did a sci-fi narration that addressed bullying but instead of talking about sexuality and gender identity, they had glitter on their face, um, and they all had to cover up their glitter and then sort of figure out, and then get, but then were, were bullied when they were found out. Um, and then there was another, another film by Youth Breaking Borders, which is an immigrant and refugee youth video making group that looked at the issues of solidarity and obstacles of solidarity between immigrant youth in New York City. Um, and, and then, Finally, there was also a, uh, a video that came out of our community media and action program that partners with social justice and community organizing groups in, in New York City as well as nationally to make their own media. So this was a video about um, Chinatown made by the Chinatown Justice Project of CAV, organizing Asian communities, and it was looking at what young people were doing around the displacement and gentrification of Chinese communities in Chinatown, New York City. And I brought this group of about 15 to 20 LGBTQ youth um, 
who were, got very engaged with each of the videos. And then one of the things that was so striking is that at the end, where is the sort of standard youth arts framework would be, the youth who made the films would sit in a panel and then the audience would get to ask them questions. Which in, some, there's, there's, in that, I, had, I was coordinating a performing arts and visual arts program at the service center, and so I was very used to that model. And instead of doing that, the young people who made the films engaged the audience in questions that they had developed. And this really also reflects GAP's sort of deep commitment to popular education and engaging media, not as a sort of a singular product, but as a way to create community, not just with the people who made the film, but amongst the audiences that we're building. So it's, it's more than just audiences. And this works so beautifully with a group of young people that I had brought. Um, who, you know, none of, and, and, and also who resonated with a lot of the issues. So I remember they, they asked a question of like, what would you do if your family couldn't afford the rent anymore in your building and so therefore was facing eviction? And a lot of the young, the young people in this group, none of whom were from Chinatown but were from other parts of New York City, were facing these issues. And they were like, there was everyone was, I want, I want to talk. And it was this incredible moment where there was more um, potential for dialogue than there actually was time for, as compared to sort of, anyone have a question? Who's who next? Um, and that mo I already loved Gap, and I fell in love with Gap even more during that time. So now, one of the things that I've loved since joining Gap is actually seeing the process of how all that comes together. The year-end screening is a result of not just the nine months that builds up to that, but also young people who return year after year and who are committed to not just the organization but the vision that the organization is about. Um, which, can we look at the, that last slide? Which it looks quite similar to a slide you just saw. We just discovered this. Get ready. It's like, looks just like that except. It's, so we, uh, <laughs> We, we work at the integration, you'll see this visually momentarily, we work at the integrate, um, we integrate media making, social change, education and popular education and youth development and believe that all those things when integrated creates a transformative space for young people and also for the communities that they're engaged in, which are intergenerational communities. It's not up there. So, I think I'll end there and then come back when we get into more questions. It's okay. We can we can keep it moving. Is it that one? No, they're the same no, one. That's the, they look very similar. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that was supposed to be the. Sorry. It'll it'll appear and then but you won't be able to tell the difference. Yeah, but that's the other one. That's the other one. Yeah. Angela, we don't have to show it. Angela, we can. Keep it moving. It's a Venn diagram. It's also a Venn diagram. That's all you need to know. Actually, I swear I pushed the right button. Sure, you know that was okay. We'll let it go. Okay. So thanks everyone for telling us about um, your work. I'm sorry about my uh, technical faux pas there at the end. Um, what can I say? I use a Mac most of the time. Um, <laughs> Uh, so it's 3.07, and we have 23 minutes left with these lovely people. And I thought what we would do is quickly, from each of you, hear one question that you're interested in hearing from this panel. And I ask it first to say, not that we're definitely going to address it or answer it, but I'm interested in collecting the questions. Um, and then uh, we'll see if we can get a little bit of headway on what seemed of interest, and then we'll get some questions from everyone in the room. Um, but before we do that, I want to say that uh, one of the things that comes out when we do youth voice, youth media work, is that the outcome is so compelling and it's so moving that it's easy to forget that we're doing community work and to think that we're only doing youth work. And it's easy to forget that we're working on ourselves and trying to figure out where we need to change. And so I hope that as we move into this part of the panel, um, I think it's just been shown over and over and over and over again how incredibly effective 
inspired, thoughtful, and critical young people can be. Um, and that with just like the, the teeniest bit of room, they'll make that happen. Um, what doesn't seem to get made and doesn't seem to get created as easily is the change in our institutions that we seem to forget our community spaces and in ourselves and that we don't always want to make room. Um, I was on a conference call the other day and someone said, well, we're trying to affect inequality and there are two ways to do that. One is to bring people down from the top and one is to bring people up from the bottom. And of course, we don't want to bring people down from the top. Of course. And it's just like a not critiqued idea. Of, I mean, you know, if you think, oh, there's an achievement gap, no one wants to hear that we brought everyone down to see, right? But the flip side of that is, is that where does the movement come from then? So it can't just be that we look at it as a gain for one person is a loss for someone else. But we do have to look at how really transformative we need to be and what, what differences we're being called on to make. Um, there was a quote in the song um, from Corey's video um, that, they, that they sang that said, we stand strong as one, a family. Um, and it really struck me because I thought, it's not a new sentiment, but it's so consistent. It's something we hear so much, and yet we don't orient that way. We have a conference where we sit at a table with microphones, and, and then like everyone else is so far away that we couldn't possibly engage with you like a family. And yet, young people, as far as I can tell, and adults as well, model what other people do, not so much what they say. I see that every day with my five-year-old and my five-month-old. I can't tell my five-month-old to calm down. I have to calm down. And then he calms down. So it's what we do. So we can say that we want to be family, but if we don't act that way, we're not going to go very far. And that causes us to have to adjust. So I'm hoping that as we move into these questions, we focus as much as we can on the multi-generational space and what changes we need to pull out of ourselves and what's hard for us and where our blinders are. Um, OK, so that's it. Uh, so question, I'm just going to run from Jesse on over. Do you have a question you'd like to pose this panel? Well, yeah, one of the questions we're deeply exploring through uh, a process we're calling youth governance is how to think about the and how to transform our organization throughout the institution um, in terms of the governance and decision making within the organization and involvement of young people in that process of decision making and how to do that meaningfully. So the question is, what are what what are what is already happening within our various organizations to do that? What are people's challenges? Uh, where, where, would, where do people want to go? So that's a governance structure question? Yeah, so the young people, it, for, here's an example just to, to sort of give it a little bit of context. In our programs, young people would ask, well, how come there's money in the budget for this, but not that, right? Um, well, and, and, and there, there are young people being involved in the process of participatory budgeting actually means that that question can then be answered by themselves, right, or in conversation between adults who are working in these organizations with young people who are part of the program. program. So, so sort of how do we think not divide the program versus the operation governance and think about what role we want our communities to play in the governance of our institutions? OK, thanks. Sasha? Yeah, um, I guess I'm just, I just, think that we're, we're here at DML 2014, and so this is a question, you know, partly for the panel here, but also for the audience um, and for the conference organizers as well. Um, it just really, um, you know, I, I feel like this is an interesting space where there are a lot of complicated conversations happening about the relationship between digital media and learning, and there's a lot of focus on youth and youth media as a kind of uh, abstracted idea or as a a siloed imaginary space. Um, I, you know, frankly, there's there's very rarely much participation here um, from young people who are involved in uh, in doing this work, and not only young people, but also since we're talking about intergenerational, you know, learning spaces, um, there's also not that much conversation about um, multi generational digital media learning spaces or spaces where elders are who's being prioritized in terms of um, engaging with with uh, with media making, and so my question is really just about um, 
what would it take to uh, transform the institutions and uh, spaces like the one we're at here uh, into spaces that looked more like family that Angela is talking about um, as a way of really keeping our, um, our research and our practice grounded um, in the needs of our communities. Maybe related to that, I've, uh, because family is forever, <laughs> I'm thinking a lot about um, duration, right? So um, how do you keep, how do you maintain solidarity over time? And I've been puzzling over that a lot as I've been working on this idea of digital afterlife and trying to follow the projects that young people carry out over periods of time post publication or post broadcast and how they often transform in that period and can have blowback for the makers in ways that haven't been anticipated as well as like new opportunities that can come during that digital afterlife. So what is the role of an organization that helped, for example, give birth to a particular project or to the author who created it as that project goes through it's um, the, the sort of the throes of its digital afterlife. And part of where I feel urgency around that is, um, you know, Corey, what you said, something that we find a lot at Youth Radio, is that some young people, they come and they stay. So when is that a good thing? And when do we need mechanisms to make sure that the work that we're doing really is building a foundation for young people to move on to other places in their lives and other opportunities? Um, so one thing that I was playing with, and so here's my question, is you know, what's the best way to think about solidarity? Is, can we think about a kind of project-based solidarity? Um, and I'm thinking about like that saying, you know, you're only as good as your last picture. You know, are we only as good as our last project in terms of how we were able to sustain, actively sustain solidarity around that work? as opposed to thinking of um, solidarity as something that either exists or not, that it's something that we're actively having to do and cultivate over time. And as I said, we, we're only as good as the last effort. Hello. Uh, my question would be, how do we adjust as family members, teachers, community members, kids, adults, grandparents, how do we adjust in this smartphone era? How, do we, how can we connect? What are ways of connecting that are outside of you know, the range of people who are billionaires trying to monitor how we connect? And how can we use uh, modern technology to, uh, to our advantage to better our communities, to better our relationships, and to, uh, to express what we really feel are the issues that are important? I think a lot of times, especially as nonprofit organizations, uh, we, we could do a better job of connecting with each other. Uh, so much of the time we spend writing for grants and possibly competing for the same foundation money. Um, how do we get past that? And how do we connect each other? Because we all have very similar goals, if not exactly the same goals uh, for our youth. Um, so how do we connect with each other in a meaningful way for our kids? And how do we bring our philosophies, like our, like our Venn diagrams that are very similar, how do we bring this philosophy into institutions that maybe aren't working so well, like public school systems? This is that moment. Are you coming to ask us a question? No. Oh. I'm going to ask a question, so this is for us to answer. Uh, I was actually looking for a, a moment for us to pause talking now that we've collected the questions that we have here to hear from you. So yes, it's your turn. Yes, please. Ask or answer. We will not pretend that we are the only people with responses to this question. <laughs> um, I'm Ann Collier, and I blog at netfamilynews.org, and I've been following digital media and youth and learning for about 15 years now. 
and I love all your work. Thank you both, so, all of you so much. I, I guess this is a question kind of mostly for Corey and Jenny and Lissa, but um, really all of you. Um, it's about how in a youth-driven organization that responds to and engages with popular culture, right? Um, do you encourage youth to push back against what's incorrect and disrespectful in popular culture, disrespectful of them? And to give you an example, I've been following the bullying and cyberbullying research for a long time, and I'm very close to that research in my work, and talk to researchers almost on a daily basis. And what we find is that bullying though it's presented in popular culture as a major problem, is far from, it's a problem, but it's far from an epidemic, and in fact, the vast majority of young people do treat each other civilly and respectfully, though they make mistakes just like adults do, and that actually workplace bullying among adults, um, you know, depending on what study you read, is, is a greater problem than bullying among youth. And so, young people are doing really beautiful work in the arts and um, media trying to solve the problem of bullying that's presented to them by popular culture. But very often, um, they're, they're trying to solve a problem that, that has been imposed on them. And they have the solutions very often. And um, is there, this is almost a media literacy question. Do the adults who work with young people and want to empower them help them see that popular culture is very disrespectful of their, their abilities and their skills and the, the way they live their lives and help steer or encourage the media literacy that enables them to like understand the problem better and find the, the right solutions to the right problem? I mean, it's sort of a complicated question, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Uh, just on the topic of cyberbullying, I have a very specific um, response to that. Um, so we have an advantage, and I suspect you guys do too, um, when you're doing the journalism side, um, that because we have a mandate to be telling new stories and we have a desire for those stories to reach the widest possible audiences, then there's always a conversation in our editorial meetings um, about how are we advancing the conversation or challenging the conversation. So you can't, that's what pitching a story is about, is you can't just be playing into what's already out there because then why would we be adding something to the mix? And instead, it's about always having to hold yourself to the standard as you're pitching stories that we're bringing something new. So on the topic of cyberbullying, um, we've you know done coverage of that in a variety of ways, including um, some live chats and some commentaries and reporting. Um, but one of the things that happened um, recently in one of these statewide conversations that we hosted across a cross-section of youth organizations was my colleague Asha, whom I mentioned, who, with whom I co-founded the um, App Lab. She said, what if we added a survey um, at the tail end of this conversation to find out um, the frequency of experiences of cyberbullying and phys physical bullying? And one of the things that came out of her little study, and granted these are very Im impressionistic kind of findings, was that physical bullying was actually a more, was much more prominent in young people's lives than cyberbullying. Right. Right, right. But not what we sort of have come to assume to be true based on um, popular conversation. And so Asha was able to, number one, acquire that data, and number two, um, report it out in, in, um, in a story in the San Francisco Chronicle that was published elsewhere. Um, and so that's an example, I think, of how um, you know, the, the kind of work that we do has a mandate built into it to kind of challenge some of those assumptions with young people being the ones who have to then carry out the inquiry and find ways to um, share insights. Uh, I, I like the question, that's a great question. Uh, in my classes, uh, my approach is to first create an environment where we can ask questions, like do you need to look like this person to get that job? Do you need to talk like this or make this type of song to have your song get played? I mean, it's kind of hard. The work that we're doing, I think, is really difficult. I can tell a kid to be, you know, 
to be someone who's self-confident and respectful, but the moment they leave my, my classroom, they watch a movie that's so, you know, against women's rights or, you know, sexism or ageism or any of the isms. So the idea is to create an environment where the kids can first really be themselves. And then we, we do a little bit of media literacy, uh, you know, talk about the media giants, how are, do you choose what you want to see or do they choose what you want to see for you? What do you want people to see? What do you think are important issues? Um, at the core of it, it's really basically getting to the conversation of like, who are you really? What do you really believe in? Are you making these decisions or are other people making decisions for you? And kids, their eyes open up really wide like, whoa, maybe I don't really like Jordans or like Coca-Cola or whatever it is because no one's ever really had that conversation with them. They're trained to be consumers very early, but they're not, they're not trained to be critical thinkers or even people with love at a very young age. So we spend the first chunk of all my classes doing icebreakers, asking questions, doing theater games where you put yourself in someone else's shoes. You know, if you were gonna do a billboard, what would your billboard look like? We, I get empty shoe boxes on the inside, tell us how you see yourself and on the outside how other people see you. And then what do you wanna show people? So I think those really baby steps are, are, are being left out a lot, um, especially in schools um, where everything is so pressure on the grade, um, that kids don't really have space to talk about themselves and what they, be, what they believe in. And that leads to the conversations where the product gets made. And Jenny will tell you more about um, how that particular song came yeah. about. So one of the things that I've observed in Corey's classes that I think is very interesting is we, uh, on one of the first days of the class, we discuss our mission statement. And we talk about what does it mean to be empowered? And Corey breaks that down into uh, asking kids, when do you feel powerful? And when do you feel powerless? And, and I think that that's important in with, with, with what Corey's saying is kids realize really quickly, and we talk about how you know, advertisements are mostly geared towards youth, and that actually youth really control a lot of, of culture especially pop culture, that they have it in, in their hands to control um, and talk about that manipulation. In the particular case of our, our video, um, we actually had several kids in the class who had experienced bullying firsthand. And through them talking that out with their peers in the class, that was how they came to the decision that bullying was going to be their theme. Can you pass that? So at Global Action Project, elemental in our mission is the, the, is the mission to expand, create, amplify media in the hands of, folk, of communities that usually don't have access to it or don't have access to, certain, to amplification. Um, so a huge part of what, we're, what we do is look at like why, why, why do we need to create media about ourselves and look at media representations of of the different communities that we're working with. And a, a huge amount of media literacy, popular education is a part of that. Uh, we also then create group norms within each group. And, and, so that there's, and so that really deepens the sense of what are the things that are okay to do here and what are the things that aren't, that they determine, that the young people determine in each group. So I, there's a huge amount of critique, certainly, of popular culture. And, and also because we're, we're engaging young people in thinking about how do you want to change the conditions in which you live, and popular culture is, is certainly part of those conditions. The other thing that we found is that in our Media and Action program, where we partner with youth leaders and youth organizers at community organizations and social justice organizations in New York City and across the country, is that that same curriculum that we use internally was profoundly, profoundly valuable to folks who are already engaged in doing social change work, but the specific engagement around the media literacy and, and then not just media literacy but then how do we make the kind of media about ourselves and distribute it to the audiences that we want to distribute it to in order to counter the narratives that are, that are out there. So that's a huge, huge piece of our work. And so huge that we actually just created a field scan documenting the, the different ways in which youth, organi youth organizers in community organizations across the country are using media 
um, to advance their work in terms of leadership development, community building, and community power towards social change. And I need water. Um, I wanted to uh, go deeper into the question that Sasha was posing um, about multi-generational work and um, sort of thinking with the context being this sort of historical context where um, the philanthropic community is very interested in saving the child, but like interested in maybe incarcerating the parents or um, and all of these other things. Um, you know, taking the children away from the parents instead of giving the parents the resources, all of that, right, is the context that we're in. And so um, I'm curious about two things. One, um, if there are resources for thinking about that you guys know about in terms of the, the practical things of funding that does specifically support intergenerational things and involving families, um, as well as what strategies, particularly maybe from Zoomix that it's on your, and Youth Radio, where your work is really youth focused, how have you engaged families maybe without that specific funding? Do you have parent orientations? What does that look like? What are maybe some successes and challenges around that? I was, I was going to say, I think that, yeah, Angela, maybe it'd be amazing to hear you reflect on this question, just based on the conversation we were having last night around the historicity, like historicizing the conversation around where investments are and where they're not, and yeah. I was actually giving the two minute signal, but uh, I'll, 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 thank you. Yeah, or raising my hand. That's, I thought I learned how to not do that in school, but <laughs> I forgot, it's been a while. Um, um, well, so we were having a conversation, I don't know if I'm gonna address your question uh, super well, so. Um, find us after if I don't. Um, but last night we had a long back and forth about this sort of, this narrative that suggests that there's a de-investment um, in schools and there's a de-investment in, uh, in young people and specifically uh, black and brown youth, poor youth, um, would have been um, debatedly described as non-dominant youth at this conference. Um, for a really lively debate of that, come see some panelists afterwards. Um, but what really was itching me, sort of like getting at me, was that the narrative that I've grown up with is very different from the idea that we're in some kind of um, current mode of deinvestment that is new. And that uh, historically, maybe it's looked different. There's sort of like assimilation oriented educational strategies, like let's take kids away from their families and educate them away from their families so we can strip them of their culture and sort of fit them into the places that we think we could use them in society, like a use resource, um, to, um, you know, modern problems of we have really hard time figuring out what to do about schools, and so we kind of don't know what to do there, and, and there are some other promising places to be, so let's go to those places. Um, but all of that, whether well-intentioned or nefariously intentioned, has... Um, a history of really not ever being truly invested in the youth that we're talking about. Um, and so after lots of back and forth, I don't know how we got to it, but I think what I really wanted to push was that as long as we are framing this as something that we're like backsliding on, if we're framing this as like we've made this progress and now we have to stop the backslide, then we're missing the larger uh, consistent societal process we've been engaged in. And this is not to say there hasn't been progress. Um, I could certainly speak directly to that, um, just being here on this panel as an individual. But as a society, our processes maintain that. We say we want to reduce inequality, rather than think dreaming really big and saying, let's eradicate inequality. Because we have this idea that that can't really happen. And part of that is because there never really has been that sort of true investment, I think. Um, in the ways that we imagine it has been. It's like the good old days. People love like happy days, and I loved happy days too. But there was this sense that um, there was this good old day to return to. And at least in my house, like we we're like, what good old days? Like I am not trying to go backwards to that. That's not something I think that I'm that I'm lacking or that I'm missing. I'm looking forward to a better future, to uh, an inclusive future. And I think when we think more broadly about that, we realize that our the problem we're trying to solve is not this small thing 
right? That it's actually the societal engagement and we need a vision for it. Um, that our visioning is really what's missing. We try to act and design and go, 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 but we don't stop and say, what's the vision of the world we're actually trying to have? Our young people tell us constantly, we want a family. We want a family, we want a family, we want a family. For all the years I've been doing this work, everyone has surveyed youth and they've told us, we want a family. And what they, what they want is relationship. They want love, they want connection. And truly I think that if we don't decide that we want to learn how to be that, then we're gonna keep making little incremental pieces, kinds of progress that still look like this gradation and, they, and that doesn't shift. So that's, is that what you were referring to? Sasha? That's, that's an amazing place to have. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, sadly, uh, we are four minutes over uh, on our time, and I don't know if we get kicked out of this room right now. Um, so what I want to do is say thank you for your presence, uh, your listening, um, and your interest, and your work. I don't know about all of your work. I know about some of it. Um, but I thank you for it, and I thank you, this panel, for making your way here and uh, for who you're being in the world and showing us what's possible. I hope that you'll stay in touch with us because I really want to keep moving forward from this place. Um, so people who are interested in following uh, what happens with this group of folks and want to connect us with what you're doing, um, let's build solidarity together. Thanks. Thank you.